Hola, 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 hola. Buen día. Gracias a la hermosa gente que viene a tiempo y todos los días. Gracias a ustedes se puede hacer este festival. Eh, tenemos el placer de tener a Scott Wilson acá, que, que nos va a dar una charla sobre Sounding the Data, Reflections on Working with Sonification. Eh, les recuerdo eh, bueno, todo lo que venimos diciendo cada día acerca del reciclaje. Eh, pero una cosa importante que tengo que anunciar, que lo voy a anunciar varias veces para que la gente no se olvide, es que eh, finalmente el camión que iba a salir hoy para ir para la, la instalación en la ENES no va a estar, porque parece que hay una cosa gremial y los choferes no sé qué, y entonces no hay camiones, no hay choferes. Entonces no va a haber esa oportunidad, lamentablemente. Entonces, eh, so today we we are we we will have I mean we are not going to have the the truck that is going to go to to NS to to check the the, install the sound installation because we have some problem with the drivers so it's not possible to have the the buses so sorry next time <laughs> thank you very much. Ali, Silvia, Daniel, Marcelo, Francina, Felipe, Anthony. Si me gustaría estar de vuelta a Morelia, por favor, disculpe ya que hablaré en inglés. Hopefully it's uh, better for everyone. <laughs> I'm, uh, so I'm going to speak uh, about sonification, uh, a bit of my experiences with it, which go back uh, quite a number of years in um, many different ways. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some ideas uh, that uh, I and uh, uh, a colleague, uh, a former student, have had about this, and I'll look a little bit at some specific projects. Um, this will maybe touch, I guess, on some of the questions that have been coming up this week, uh, sort of seemingly over and over again about how art um, can be relevant or can it make a difference. Uh, and then just in the end, I'll maybe say a bit about the performance I'm going to do this evening. Um, which involves sonifying some climate data, of course, and um, that maybe brings us again to the kind of themes and ambitions of the festival. So that's kind of the, uh, the menu for, uh, for this talk. Uh, so this is uh, some info on sonification and maybe one way of talking about what it is. Um, this is probably a review, I think, for most of you, but again, um, you know, somehow using data to generate sound may be analogous to visualization. Um, and there's different sorts of approaches to this. Um, I do find it really interesting, though, that this is something that's kind of, you know, it's been in and out of fashion over the years, but it does seem, despite being around for a long time, something that people have a hard time talking about, um, you know, the details of what are they actually doing when they do it, you know? Um, and it gets very, very sort of woolly and vague sometimes when people are trying to explain that. Um, so we had in Birmingham a really wonderful doctoral student who, who just recently finished, they've named uh, Milad Marke Kozravi, he's from Iran, and he was working on sonifying cancer data. And so I was working with him when he was in the last stages of his PhD and he was writing his commentary, and so he starts trying to talk about this. And, you know, when you're supervising people, it's sort of your job to kind of, when they sort of wave their hands and try to pass over something, you kind of go, ah, no, 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 you need to explain that better. Uh, and so he tried really hard, and he um, did a big literature review, and it, that was interesting, because he'd say, well, so-and-so talks about it this way, and we kept talking about it, and I think, oh, that's not really right. You know, I don't think that's quite getting it. So we ended up kind of going on this tangent away from his PhD and um, working out a kind of framework to talk about this, uh, which eventually led to an article, which is in Leonardo, which if anybody wants a, a copy of, they can have. Um, and this is called a strata-based approach to discussing artistic data sonification. Um, and basically, we have these kind of three um, strata of um, approaches, if you like, to sonification, generative, elusive, and curatorial. Um, and these are, um, well, as you can sort of see, they're, they're cumulative rather than distinct. So the, the higher ones uh, assume the presence of the latter one. You can have the bottom, but if you have the top, um, it took us a while to kind of arrive on that, kind of, I think it's the right one, like, like layers of soil building. Um, so I'll just talk through that briefly. Um, so the first one is, is this generative one. So this is kind of a, a primarily musical approach, and the idea is you get some data, 
and we're plugging it into an algorithm of some sort to sonify it, and we're using this really as a way to create some interesting musical material. Um, and you know, and in this sort of tradition of um, algorithmic music, uh, indeterminacy, all this kind of stuff, um, you know, the idea is maybe you get some material that you couldn't have come up with otherwise. You know, so it's a way of getting something interesting. Um, and you know, as we're defining this uh, in purely generative sonifications. The, the data source just doesn't really matter. We're just trying to get something that sounds good, basically. And in fact, the data could be fake or invented or generated. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Um, so the next, uh, the next strata is elusive. So in this case, we've moved beyond generating novel sonic material. Um, the source of the data does matter, and it's alluded to. Um, this can be understood as a direct experience of the data, the meaning of which is linked to its source, broader significance and context, um, but still primarily an artistic rather than a scientific tool. And the reason I say that is it's not really, uh, in this case, uh, at this level yet, intending to really tell you something important or specific about the data. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the kind of analogy to visualizations, so, uh, you know, uh, a sonification can be like a graph. It can tell you something about the character of that data. Um, but in this case, um, it matters that we know what it is, but we're not necessarily trying to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, um, it's probably just worth saying that this is, uh, at least to my way of thinking, not anything new, right? I mean, I know we, we have these inherited ideas of program versus abstract music or something, but actually, like, if you think about what people you know, actually do with music. There's with, through titles and program notes and pre-concert talks and album covers and all this stuff. Um, we don't really have this pure um, experience of an abstract um, existence of a piece of music. Right? We have all of this explication with context around it. And so sort of saying this piece is made out of climate data, that becomes part of somebody's holistic experience of that piece, right? Whether, whether they can hear something important about the data. Um, I think that makes sense. Um, and then that brings us to the, the curatorial level. So at this level, it goes beyond this illusion um, and wants to bring out some sort of salient aspects of it. Um, and, and like in a, in a visualization, um, you know, when we're presenting a visualization, we're, we're, we're making decisions about what, how to visualize it, what, if we're going to have axes, what are we going to put on the axes. How are we going to present things? So there's a kind of curation in that, right? Like we're deciding what to emphasize, what's important. Um, and, and, you know, this gives us some criteria to judge the success. So do we do a good job of um, representing the data? Or are we doing a bad job of representing the data and sound? Are we hiding those salient aspects or are we, are we bringing them out? And um, you all probably remember the many arguments, for example, over the hockey stick graph and the kind of the smoothing algorithms and things that we use for this. And the, four or five different inquiries that ended up going into that as basically people were trying to say that it was hiding important things. And in the end, I think everybody was exonerated, but it gives you a sense of those sorts of things. Um, and I just, uh, I always like to um, uh, refer people, uh, I won't, because time is, is a little short, I won't actually open up and show anything, but there's this wonderful website uh, by a guy named David McAnalyst called Information is Beautiful. Um, and um, it, he does wonderful, wonderful visualizations, which are really, really great. And, and they are actually beautiful. And, um, and they're great about bringing things out. He also had a kind of related set website, which uh, gave like good news every week, which I was, during the pandemic, I was following quite avidly just because I needed, I think we need some good news now and again as well. Um, not saying that the theme has been a little bit dark this year, but um, yeah. Uh, OK, uh, speaking of dark things, though. Um, <laughs> I'll move on to a little, a little project uh, that, well, it's actually not that little project. It went on for many years. Um, it's kind of, kind of, sort of seems to have come to a fairly natural ending now. But um, uh, so this is a project called Dark Matter, uh, and it was a collaboration. Uh, we have had, had a laptop ensemble that was started in um, 2011 in Birmingham. It's called the Birmingham Ensemble for Electroacoustics Research, which it turns out spells beer. Who knew? Um, Birmingham loves acronyms, so it's make a little fun of that. Um, and so this was a collaboration between our laptop ensemble and the Art at CMS project at CERN. So CERN is the, the host of the home of the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest particle accelerator. 
and CMS is one of the two major experiments there. And so of course they have an art, funded art project associated with it because that's a rounding error in their budget, you know, so throw a little bit of money at art. Um, and we took some data from what was called the scouting stream and we used this to um, uh, parameterize synthesis algorithms, um, basically live coding um, uh, as a performing network lack topology. Um, and this happened in um, uh, many, many places, in the UK, Canada, Turkey, Athens. We did it in a, in a taverna in the high Peloponnese um, above Sparta, which was quite interesting. There was a kind of Albanian olive farmer who came and um, gave us some quite interesting comments that our music sounded like Verdi and things like this. You never know, you never know what feedback you're going to get. Don't judge your audience. It's good advice. Um, we did workshops on this for musicians, and we had some kind of um, um, spin-offs with things. I keep meaning to, um, I should take out the thing with the Barbican because it never happened um, when I wrote that slide. Um, this is a little um, trailer. Uh, oh, I meant to check if I had internet access. Let's see if that works. Is it working? Mm. Wait. Nope, I don't have internet access. Um, I thought I had that here. Sorry, man. Uh, Elkin, yep. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to give you a little taste of that. Say um, uh, actually maybe yeah, get it. Um, I won't say too much about the technical stuff of this, but um, basically, you know, like with a lot of uh, sonification, you doing we did parameter mapping sonification. So we're getting um, for each subatomic particle, we're getting uh, these coordinates, um, uh, three different coordinates, um, eta, phi, and uh, tau and basically tell us um, uh, the position of them in effect a moment after the collision, um, which is also the same thing as um, effectively the velocity because by how far out they've come from the center, you can get that. And you could, for instance, match them to pitch, loudness, and duration. Um, this is just a little animation of um, maybe what it would look like as a collision happens. Um, Um, they get a kind of massive amount of um, data produced, um, so they need a kind of management strategy. They get like a billion collisions a second. So they're basically selecting the most interesting events from that stream, and that was basically what we got was this kind of first pass uh, data sequence of events. Um, now they, quite, they were quite happy with this, but they wanted something that would be a little bit easier to do with um, uh, kids in workshops because they do a huge amount of outreach there. Um, so we invented this kind of web app called the uh, Interactive Physics Sonification System, um, which was uh, quite fun uh, kind of thing to put together. Konstantinos Vasilakos, who is working on the product, kind of led on this. Um, and basically, we kind of set it up as a website with a web app, which lets you select physics events, figure out how to map them to do some sonification and make some funny sounds. And then there's also teaching them about kind of classic synthesis approaches with classic waveforms and envelopes and things like this. 
Um, so it kind of has a kind of two-sided educational aspect to that. Um, and you know, so why 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 do this? Um, you know, uh, maybe uh, going back to the original project, I, I remember at the premiere, it really made me rethink a lot about um, what I was doing and the assumptions that I brought. I never really bought the kind of program music, abstract music argument, um, but I think people came up to me and they were so excited by this performance and they were so into it. Um, you know, and in a sense, you know, um, I always say to people about sonification, like when people go, oh, this is the sound of particle physics or this is the sound of climate change. It's not, right? It's the sound of that data plugged into whatever algorithm you wrote and you've made decisions about the character. And, and you, you know, you could argue perhaps that, you know, if we just sat down and improvised, I mean, it wouldn't have been the same, but it wouldn't have been a million miles away. Um, yet for the audience, this gave them something, something that they knew that was out there in the world that was interesting and exciting. Um, and big, and it gave them this, that as a kind of scaffold to hang their experience off of, and that was made it more meaningful for them than us just improvising. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, um, uh, that was interesting, and it, so hopefully that gets people thinking about those things, engages them. Um, with the web app, um, it was just, you know, it was a way of trying to make the whole thing really fun for them. Now, how do you teach, you know, 11-year-olds about particle physics? Um, you've got to get them, give them something that they can do with. So, I mean, I've got some photos here. Um, this is from a workshop in Wales where we really had to do a, a workshop with 40 11-year-old kids um, in a kind of um, school, in a, in a, I gather, kind of disadvantaged area in North Wales. Um, and we did a, got them to do drawings, and we did a performance with them, which was, you can imagine, 40 kids with tablets in a reverberant gymnasium was quite an experience. <laughs> um, luckily, uh, Emma Margotson, who was another of uh, our doctoral students uh, who um, recently finished, she was, uh, had done a lot of uh, stuff like this outreach. So I was really, really grateful to have her there helping with that. Um, this is a similar workshop we did in Athens uh, as part of a conference there. And, um, and I, the next one actually is just a video of um, in Toronto, uh, at the science center there, I was kind of in town at the same time that the people from CERN were doing workshops there, and this was actually the first kind of run of this. We had high school age kids, and you know what high school age kids are like, right? Uh, they like to make jokes, they like to make fun, and you know, and when they started making the sounds, of course, the first thing they did was they made all the parameters, so everything sounded like doorbells and farts and stuff like this. And I thought, oh my god, this is going to be terrible. This whole project is a failure. But then I watched them actually playing, and I realized they were laughing. And I realized if they're laughing, they're engaged. And if they're engaged, they're paying attention. And they're actually probably learning something, even if they weren't trying to. Um, so if you just, you can just see these lovely guys here having a bit of fun in there. Sebastian, you can make a GG level out of this. So it's different. Hey, Sebastian, you can make a Johnson Star show out of this. Anyway, <laughs> so I think that worked, you know. Um, so uh, that's so maybe you know again just hinting at this idea that because sonification is a way of um, you know bringing something from the rest of the world into uh, you know uh, what otherwise might be a quite sort of rarefied musical practice, um, that's maybe a small way to get people engaged and affect some kind of change. Um, I was really happy to be able to do a kind of spin-off of this project, which was a big, um, a big orchestra piece uh, with the Esprit Orchestra in Toronto, which was for um, orchestra, multi-channel electronics, and video. Um, I didn't, this wasn't done in real time or improvised, because if anybody's worked with orchestras, you know how much orchestra rehearsals cost. Um, so you've got to be practical. Um, but I used a few different kind of um, strategies for the sonifications in this. Um, one was kind of, um, the first movement was just a kind of uh, straight sonification of, uh, of uh, one thing that went through, um, and then I kind of uh, found a way of transcribing that into notation, made that as a kind of a core, um, almost like if you, people know gamelan, like a balloon kind of skeletal melody that went through, and then kind of orchestrated around that. Um, in the second movement, there's a kind of imitative things and a kind of accompaniment built around sonifications that are happening in the electronics. Um, in the last movement, there's a kind of rhythmic thing that comes uh, with the, um, uh, in the electronics, uh, which the uh, orchestra plays along with. 
Um, the visualizations were similar to schemes that we developed for the live coding project, but because it was non-real-time, I could get them a little higher quality. So I worked with Blender, um, which was very helpful because the university had a, a, has a high-performance computing cluster, um, which has Blender on it, so you can sort of go off and gob off 20 processors to do your um, Blender code, which if you're like me and you're sort of trying to learn this stuff, and I'm sure my Blender stuff is like super inefficient. So, um, yeah. Uh, so maybe I just, um, some of you heard a little bit of this the other day because it's in the background on the, um, um, on the um, uh, CMS Plus video, but I'll just play a little bit of this. close to like the, the representation that you get in the data of like a, the chandelier like thing to show the individual particles and the, the animations were showing when the subatomic particles were going to be animated. So it's a bit on the nose, but <laughs> no need to applaud at this time. Um, so uh, that was that one. Um, and that brings me a reasonable amount of time left to um, the last thing, which is to this. Uh, what if there's nothing you can do? So this is, um, this is basically what I'm going to do tonight. Um, this is uh, something that I kind of developed over the last couple of years. Um, and it's a, basically a kind of framework for doing performances, improvised performances, uh, which I do with live coding. Um, it basically, there's not much prescribed in it except that everything comes out of one uh, single accordion sample, which um, was for a piece that... Um, I think I probably wrote in the early 2000s, I can't remember exactly when, um, and it was not premiered. I seem to have very bad luck with this piece. Uh, the accordionist, um, accordion broke, so he couldn't premiere it. Then the second premiere got cancelled, then he told me he was quitting playing new music and was going to do a mall gig with his clarinet wife, playing wife, which, uh, you know, okay. Um, and then several other accordionists were interested in it and said they would do it. And for some reason, various reasons, which I won't bore you with, it, it just never happened. You know, so, um, you know, so maybe one aspect of the title is, you know, what if there's nothing you can do about your piece that never gets played? <laughs> um, as it happens, it did actually, in 2018, it finally got played in, in Bogota, which was really, really nice. And then after that, uh, Eva Zollner, a very fine uh, German clarinet, uh, accordionist, sorry, um, picked it up and played it quite a bit, including on tour, including in this room, actually. Um, it is actually now my, I think, my most played piece in Mexico. So um, I don't know if that's a category most people have or not. But, um, uh, so, you know, don't give up hope, maybe is the message there. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, I, I have an example of another performance of this, and maybe I'll just play a little bit of this one for you as well. So this is um, in Bangkok uh, last April with um, some really wonderful Thai musicians, um, uh, Patakon Prichanan, Pataru, and Anat Narkong, um, which was quite nice. So just because um, I know that a couple of people won't be here tonight, I'll just give you a little taste of something like what it might sound like, which without, without the reason.
Uh, okay, anyway, I mean, that was, that was like, that was actually the, my kind of first uh, outing after COVID, um, really go somewhere else and play with people. And, um, and I just uh, have to say, I mean, that's all I think about in general, how much I come to this really wonderfully sensitive position. Um, lovely, you know, what, a, what a nice thing to be a part of. Um, so, I mean, as I said, this has become um, something that I've, I've done a few times in different places, and it's a kind of easy thing in a way, theoretically, to get together. Um, the title, as I said, um, what if there's nothing you can do? So, yeah, so one thing was, what about the piece? Another thing is, is a little bit of poking fun at myself of, like, well, what if there's nothing you can do with this one accordion sample, which I have to say, every time I do this, is a question I ask myself. Um, uh, but it's also to do um, with other aspects of my life. And I mean, this was a question that I found in things with work, personal life, um, just other family, other things going on. It seemed to be like a kind of question that I ended up facing over and over again at a certain point. And I'm, I don't know if it's just the, the weight of the pandemic that pushes us into this kind of mindset sometimes. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, another way that we could, my place, we might ask this question is, is, you know, things like climate change and ecological crisis. Um, you know, and, and this kind of climate despair, you know, is, is, is something that people are talking about more and more and, and have this sort of crushing weight of it. Um, you know, so I end up at this, and I find this actually very personally quite depressing sometimes, and um, I end up at this question, you know, what if there is nothing you can do? And I think that sounds um, probably quite, quite fatalistic. Um, and... You know, maybe that's partly because we, I think we tend to kind of, um, we look for solutions, don't we? We want to know how are we going to fix it. We look for, a, so we think about this as a problem that needs a solution. We don't think about this as maybe a process, something that we're going to do together, that we're going to work through, um, that we're maybe finding a kind of um, path or a better path to kind of live on. Um, and, and looking at it that way, I think I, I personally find this idea um, really kind of liberate, liberating in a sense to accept that, you know, maybe I can't fix this or maybe I can't do this. Um, and knowing that, you know, you or we may fail about these things through no fault of our own actually, in a strange sort of way, frees you from this kind of crushing responsibility to succeed and maybe opens up a little space where you can be hopeful and you can work with other people and contribute with others, which I hope is, I think is what we in, in some ways, um, to find those kinds of better paths. Um, and yeah, and just to finish, for me, uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's, you know, as we face these things, we don't know what to do. It's, it's not all on us. It's not up to us as individuals to solve this. We don't have to solve this as individuals. But I do think we need to, to hope. Um, and it's been really lovely this week to hear um, so many of you speak about the small ways that you are kind of thinking, changing your thinking, changing other people's thinking, um, contributing to ways that we might change attitudes bit by bit, and, and actually really already living your lives on, on somehow better paths. Uh, and for me, that's really a, a very hopeful thought. So, uh, so gracias. That's it. Muchas gracias. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Ipsos. Yeah.